Kia ora, Nick. Kia ora, uh, Kia ora koutou. Thanks for um, listening to me and thanks for the invite. Uh, so I work for a place called uh, the Kirutu National Trust. Just a little bit about uh, me. Um, my uh, working life has actually been in the agriculture sector. Most recently, something called deer industry in New Zealand. Before that, the meat industry. Before that, the dairy industry. Um, but before that, I was kind of a scientist. I did um, genetics and molecular biology back when that was a little bit prehistoric. Um, so, topic of the uh, of the presentation. Um, I was trying to be a little bit cheeky. Um, private land, the other conservation estate. So just kind of echoing Nick's introduction there. Um, we're a conservation organisation, QE2, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, but I kind of sometimes um, feel slightly grumpy when people talk about the conservation estate as if it's the place where conservation takes place. And my, my clear view is that uh, conservation is a practice um, rather than a place, um, and we need to be thinking about the entire picture. And possibly those of you who are interested in um, you know, science around uh, biodiversity and bioprotection of biodiversity um, need to think pretty broadly about what conservation is and where it is as well. Uh, hashtag bioprotection21, sorry, I don't know how to do that. Um, so <laughs> what I will um, talk to you about are just four things is what I'm going to tell you. Uh, my view on pro what private land conservation is, um, what QE2 does in that space, what our role is, um, the opportunities and challenges around private land biodiversity, or at least the QE2 style of private land biodiversity, and then just, um, you know, you guys are the bioprotection people, but just a few thoughts at the end there about, um, you know, what I, I think might be places to look. So, private land conservation, this is my view, I'm not an academic, I haven't studied this in detail, but I'll give you three categories um, to put it under. Um, the first um, is what QE2 really specialises in and what it was set up to do, which is a block um, of conservation land within a, a larger commercial uh, landowning operation. Um, in most cases, um, that's a pastoral farming operation. I'll show you some pictures. Um, the second one is you know, probably much more prevalent in the last few, maybe decade, than, than what it was before that, is actually really keen conservation type people who go out and buy a property specifically for the purpose of doing biodiversity protection on it. Um, and then the third one, this is where you've got to think broadly, is it's not confined to a place, it's actually a landscape scale project um, being undertaken by a group of people, either with a, a formal leadership or just on a, uh, an emergent community basis. So I'll just show you some pictures to illustrate those, those three things. Um, number one, this is a pretty, well it's not really that typical, but this is, this is what QE2 specialises in. This is a chunk of uh, kahikatea forest in the middle of a, a really um, you know, well utilised productive landscape. Um, that one's probably unusual um, because the biodiversity is on really flat, easy land that, that someone could easily put a dairy cow on. Uh, another example of that, category one, so this, that's a wetland. Um, again, you can see the pasture in the background, so this is a highly productive uh, landscape. Um, third example of the same thing, this is a bit more typical, so that's on a side of a hill, it's probably southerly facing, less productive, so for some reason it got left alone some hundreds of years ago, um, and now it's, it's there for conservation purposes. Category two, um, I was trying to look for some examples that, that didn't have a privacy issue, but um, this is a place called uh, Mahakiro um, Forest Estate, this is in the Coromandel Peninsula, um, there's actually, in that, in that yellow uh, highlighted area, there's actually 27 titles there. Um, but these were marketed some uh, 15 or 20 years ago as conservation titles. So people, if they wanted to buy one, had to be interested in conserving the bush that was on there. So those, those were covenanted with QE2 um, before people got to buy them. This place is actually really impressive. Um, and the little pictures on the right there, um, Peripetus, uh, the, the Coromandel striped gecko, um, and the people, the residents, the kind of citizens who live there discovered um, the Coromandel striped gecko on their properties. Um, Archie's frog, which is probably New Zealand's rarest native frog, um, and the forest ringlet butterflies. So these are all highly endangered species that exist 
um, primarily their stronghold is in this spot in the middle of the Coromandel that's in private ownership. Yeah? Um, so, you know, the folk from Doc come here to have a look at Archie's frogs. Um, the third example, um, this is the landscape scale thing. This is where I live. This is a, um, commonly known as the Miramar Peninsula out in the middle of Te Whanganui Atara, the, the great harbour of Tara. Um, this actually is where Tara uh, and his sons had their first uh, settlement when they came to Wellington. At that time it was known as Te Motu Kairangi, the island, the Kairangi Island, um, because the little isthmus and this uh, spot down here is Wellington Airport. Um, that isthmus that the airport is on was actually another channel into the harbour. So that was an island. Um, so I had some quite interesting um, biodiversity, some of which is still there. Um, and what we're doing there is something called predator-free Miramar, whereby we're trying to kill off all the mustelids and rats and possums and such like. And we're kind of most of the way there. Um, but this is, you know, this is community-driven um, conservation on a broad scale. It's not, it's not fixed in a place. Um, it's about a bunch of people, really, um, doing, a, doing a thing together. So that's, that's kind of my definitions of private land conservation. Um, why is that important? Well, uh, really simply, 70% of New Zealand is in private ownership. So if you want to have conservation going on across New Zealand, um, you're going to need to include the private land in that. Um, secondarily, um, the private land is where we went first, right? So when New Zealanders came, both Māori and European people arrived, the places they wanted to be and settle and develop um, were the flat, easy coastal places. Um, and that's where the people are, still are, and that's the land that's in private ownership. The stuff that was tough to get to, that wasn't so fertile, uh, that's the stuff that's now our um, public conservation land. So that's at the top of hill. So there's plenty of that, right? There's a lot of beach forests um, in conservation, but what there isn't um, is lowland ecosystems, uh, dune lands, uh, wetlands are under heavy threat, uh, coastal forests. These are very rare. So. Um, any little bit of it you can find, it's really important to try and protect that. And where you find it is on private land. Um, so that's why private land is, is particularly important from a biodiversity perspective, if we want to have any hope of retaining those, those rare ecosystems. So that's private land biodiversity, kind of. Um, what, what's my role in that, or what's my organisation's role in that? Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what QE2 is first. Um, people who are focused on the agriculture sector probably know, but I suspect there's some of you who don't. Um, anyone who lives in town doesn't know what QE2 does. When I said I got a job at QE2, people said, oh, that swimming pool in Christchurch. OK. <laughs> That's cool. <coughs> Didn't know you liked swimming. <coughs> I don't like swimming. Um, so, Independent Charitable Trust, uh, it's set up under its own Act of Parliament, was set up in 1977. Uh, just 1977 doesn't mean anything to you. That's pre formation of the Department of Conservation. Um, we are funded, about 80% comes through a government grant, and um, increasingly we're relying on charitable donations to get done what we need to get done. The concept at the time, um, and, and the flavour is still there, is by farmers for farmers. So um, the, the history of it was actually that. This is in the late 70s, early 80s, when um, government was actually incentivising and pressing quite hard for development of land. Drain, drain the swamp, clear the scrub, and create more um, productivity out of the land so we can um, redress our balance of payments issue. Um, and there was a few uh, farmers who actually were pushing back against this and saying, well, actually, no, I quite like that. Um, bit of forest that I have on my property and I would like for that to be there forever, even after I sell the place or, or let the boy have it. Um, so it was a couple of leading people um, in Federated Farmers, actually, who pushed for the, um, for the Act to be created. Um, and so it was, it was created in 1977. Apparently the, the story goes that the name QE2 was based on the fact that Rob Muldoon was a, a hardcore royalist and, he, and they thought that would get it across the line with them if they, if they named it after the, after the Queen. So they did. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen when something, when, when Charles becomes whatever it is. I think we'll kick. So what, what do we do? Uh, we um, partner with, um, with those private landowners to protect that 
chunk of land in perpetuity. So um, what does that look like? So our main business is covenants. So a covenant is a legal agreement reached voluntarily between the landowner and us that attaches to the title of the land. So that covenant um, will generally say, um, thou shalt not chop down the forest, uh, graze the forest, uh, build a quarry or a mine, uh, develop, subdivide. Um, so it's basically a, a legal prohibition over things that would compromise the biodiversity or some other conservation value. So I've been talking about biodiversity, but there are covenants that protect um, archaeological sites or sites of particular um, cultural or landscape um, imperative. Um, but we're talking sort of 90% biodiversity. Um, physical protection, um, by and large, particularly if you're in a pastoral farming landscape, you need to put a fence around these things to protect them. Um, QE2 will come to the party with um, half of the fencing money, which is um, one of the, the incentives we offer. Um, and then we have a commitment that we will be there forever. So a QE2 person will go back and visit the landowner, either the original landowner or a successive landowner, um, and have a conversation with them about um, how the covenant values are being upheld. Um, that, so that's um, kind of a, a monitoring and compliance exercise, but um, our, our method really is about relationship management, so um, we need to stay friends with those landowners. So that seems like a, a, a nice thing to do. Um, since 1977, um, I think that number's actually a little bit out of date, and we're up about 4,700 covenants um, and pushing towards 190,000 hectares. So just to give you a little bit of context, 180,000 hectares is about the size of Stewart Island. It's about the size of the three remaining North Island National Parks. Um, so it's, it's a fair old chunk of land. And here's a, here's a picture of what they look like. Um, we'll see if we can make the technology do something clever. Oh, ooh, come on. <laughs> Give me some oohs, people. <laughs> oh, hey, it's good, it's good. So there they are. It's kind of like the stars in the night sky. So um, lots of little dots. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That's what I wanted. Um, so here, here, they, here they kind of are. That's not quite as impressive, is it? Um, that was my backup in case the YouTube didn't work. Um, so by and large, we're talking tiny little dots all over the country, 4,500 spread about the place. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, there are a couple of exceptions, so this fella down here is something called the Mahu Whenua Covenants, and this is a guy, Shania Twain's ex, uh, who um, bought four um, high country Crown Pastoral Lease blocks, uh, Soho, Motutapu, uh, Coronet, and one other that I can't remember right now, 50,000 hectares, so out of my 180,000, um, that's quite a big chunk, and it kind of distorts some of our figures. Um, but by and large, um, we're talking much smaller blocks. Um, this is kind of what's in them. So this is um, everything, and this is, this is probably a more typical representation. Um, all registered covenants, oh, gee. Um, this, is, this is mahu whenua, right? So this is high country, um, central Otago, and it's all, well, it's not all, mostly, it's mostly grassland, tussock land. Um, but if you look at um, kind of our typical in any given year, what we're talking about is forest, and what we're talking about typically is secondary modified forest. So it's been turned over once, it's had the, the big podocarps taken out for timber, um, but since then it's been left alone and it's regenerating nicely, um, and, and someone wants to look after it, so it's got a fence around it and a covenant over it. So um, how do we do that? How do you do it? Um, Work with the willing. So essentially, our, our people, and we've got about um, 30 uh, regional reps um, across the country, and they sit and wait for the phone to ring, um, or, except they're not sitting, they're, they're running most of the time, they're, they're pretty busy. Um, but it's, it's a reactive process, right? So people come to us and say, hey, I want to do that thing, and we say, sure, we can help. Um, so it's the willing who, who are coming to us, um, it's heavily reliant on the reputation of both QE2 and that rep. So 
most of the kind of recommendations will come by word of mouth. Um, the fact that QE2 and that rep are independent of any kind of regulatory agency is pretty important to people um, wanting to do this with us. Um, and we will work individually with each landowner. It's not a one-size-fits-all, but the covenant um, document and, and the physical arrangements around protection of the place will be tailored to the person. So it's about looking after that person. So as I said earlier, it's, it's heavily reliant on, on relationships um, and the creation of goodwill. Um, and, and so you're going, well, why, why, does it, why do people call? Why do they want to do that? Um, and, yeah, it's kind of surprising to me. But talking to a few, um, the answers are one, of, one or all of these three things. Um, first of all, um, the landowner does actually care about that block of forest or that wetland, and they, and they like it, and they want to make sure someone doesn't bulldoze it one day. Um, they don't usually use the word biodiversity. They don't like long words like that, but they say, I like those trees, or um, I like the birds that live up there. Sorry, I'm being, I'm being um, generalising. Um, there are some, certainly those ones who buy land for conservation purposes certainly know what, what biodiversity is. Um, the second kind of set, set of motivations is around farming pragmatism. So often the fence will be going around a pretty tricky gully on the farm that people tend to lose stock in anyway and doesn't grow much grass. So actually it doesn't uh, make much sense to try and keep that in the farming system. Um, and it's much easier to handle your stock um, if you can just go round that gully without them going in there and disappearing. Um, the other sort of pragmatism is if you consider that biodiversity protection is part of your corporate uh, ethos or, or brand, um, then doing the right thing is actually part of what you want your, your corporate values to be. So I'd call that sort of pragmatism. Um, and then the third one is slightly difficult to define, but um, this, is, this is generally people coming to the end of their, um, their land management careers, um, not always, but often, and they will be saying, well, what, what am I actually going to leave behind? I'm going to disappear off this, off this whenua, and what's going to be my mark that I leave behind? And they say, well, a good thing to do would be to protect this piece of land forever and make sure that that bush um, stays there um, forever. So those are the kind of reasons. It's often a mixture of all three of those um, that drives people. So on to um, sort of opportunities and challenges in... Um, in private land conservation, and I guess with a, with a particular QE2 perspective on this, um, what, makes it, what makes it good first? So opportunities, um, what makes conservation kind of easy here uh, is that they are generally small blocks, so apart from that 50,000 hectares, um, the average size, uh, well mean size is about 40 hectares, that's because 50,000 blows out the top end of it. Um, but the median area is about eight hectares, right? So that's, that's something that's quite manageable for one person or one family to actually get in and take care of pest and weed control in there. So it's generally uh, manageable chunks um, of land. Just to put that into um, perspective, um, that public conservation estate is about eight and a half million hectares, if you add up all the bits, types of dock land. Um, and I think they... Um, DOC employs about 2,000 people, so you guys do the maths on that, and I think it comes out about 4,000 hectares each, um, which, is, which is pretty tough. Um, so the people who, who live near those blocks, they tend to be pretty near where you live, um, they're often um, farming people, um, they've got a tractor, um, they've got a chainsaw, um, they've probably got a weed sprayer as well, so there's people there who kind of um, can get their hands dirty and do stuff, and they generally do. The model, this model of conservation is extremely low cost um, to the public, um, basically because the private landowner does all the work. Um, social licence, I understand you guys have been talking about social licence. Um, if the landowner says it's cool, then you can go and do it. Um, so uh, I understand that that life's getting pretty tough for science work on that, on that public land. So this is a resource um, where, you know, if you want to try things out, um, you, can, you can certainly find out of those 4,500 landowners one who's going to be interested in the sort of thing you're interested in. Um, and so you can get in there with their permission and, and do stuff. Um, and the final point there is kind of linked to my one about rare and threatened uh, habitats is that 
um, you know, if we do actually want to restore some of the um, ecosystems from the, the low lands and the coastal lands, these are the places that you're going to find the species and the genetics to be able to repopulate and, um, and restore some of that, um, that ecology. So those are kind of the good things. Um, what makes it a bit, bit hard? So um, those little blocks are, are kind of susceptible, is the first thing. So um, they're near to someone's garden, they're near to the farm, so bits and pieces that come out of gardens that are some of our key weeds, particularly in urban areas, are prevalent. Um, they have a high edge ratio, so you know, when a storm or a flood comes along, um, you know, those little blocks can get wiped out. Um, they've often or usually got livestock around them, so if the livestock um, aren't um, well constrained by way of fences, then um, they can get smashed pretty, pretty quickly. Um, we do have cases where the landowner is either you know, a bit past getting out in their covenant or they've, they've lost interest, um, so that can be pretty hard to address when people are kind of uh, disengaged. Um, and then finally, you know, if, particularly when we're talking about farmers, they've got a lot else on their plate, right? So they're not focused primarily on conservation. Um, they've got a lot of other stuff to worry about, um, including the sort of regulatory stuff that's, that's coming down the pipeline pretty um, heavily at, at farmers at the moment. Um, so they can become, you know, distracted. So, uh, how am I going for time? Seven minutes. So, bioprotection. This is a bioprotection symposium, so I thought I'd better say something about this. Um, what could you help us with on pests and weeds? Uh, well, biologically, um, pest animals are kind of the same as what you guys probably all know about as ecological problems. Um, feral ungulates are a major problem all across the country at the moment, probably more so than they have been um, at any time in the past. Uh, we install wherever we can nowadays uh, deer fences around covenants because um, the, the prevalence of goats and deer in the landscape is um, getting to the point where there's not much point just putting a, a normal uh, seven wire fence around things. Uh, mustelids, you guys know those. Rodents, yep, those are tough. Uh, marsupials, so increasingly, especially down this way, um, wallabies are um, a small but, but growing threat. Um, possums are everywhere. Uh, wasps, that's on bioprotection. I'm thinking, you know, agriculture industry and conservation sector can all get behind a bioprotection for wasps, can't we? Um, and I just put in very small writing at the bottom there, cats, because I don't want any hate mail. <laughs> <coughs> Um, I forgot hedgehogs, sorry. Um, this is Teddy Winkle. Um, pest plants, uh, it's, there's nothing new here that, that you guys don't already know. Trees, so high country stuff. Uh, that mahu whenua, you know, um, there's some real challenges around wild and conifers. Nobody is surprised at that. Buy control for, for conifers, anybody? Uh, sycamore is going to be the next thing. Um, Willow in wetlands, blackberry in wetlands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's lots and lots of these things. There's long lists. Every uh, regional council has has one of these lists. There's nothing nothing new. Vines. So vines are a particular sort of ecological weed, um, not not a pasture or a production uh, weed. But um, these things, particularly old man beard, um, ivy, moss plant, banana passion fruit, um, these get up over the top of native forest canopy and can cause a real problem. Um, and then some more that you know about, shade tolerant um, shrubs or weeds, um, Tradescantia, well, wow, biocontrol, cool. Um, woolly nightshade, ginger, there's lots of those, there's a long list. So there's nothing really unusual about those. Uh, diseases, microbes, so nothing unusual you guys haven't heard about about those. Um, Cody dieback, myrtle rust are, are problems ecologically. So, so what's different? What's different about private land conservation that, that bioprotection people should um, should think about. Uh, hey tangata is, is the difference. Um, it's the people who are in charge of those places and who are, are doing the conservation work that are different. So I know scientists struggle sometimes with people, um, but I think we need, to, uh, we need to think about this. So I've just highlighted a few of these things here. Um, so um, what's different in terms of the people aspects? Um, there's, there's limited public access to these places, so um, some covenants are, are, are open to public access, free for all, 
Most are not, so particularly when you're in a uh, production agriculture environment, farmers won't be that keen to have people traipsing across the land to get to the Covenant to go for a little wander around. Um, so they generally say um, public access with permission. Um, so, so you can get in there and do things without um, fear of uh, hurting the public is one interesting aspect for bioprotection. Um, the landowners will get out in their tractor or on their quad with their sprayers um, and they will do stuff. They, they are a, a resource to be used um, and they're happy to do that without, uh, I, don't, I need to be careful what I say here, but um, they don't need to fill out 17 forms before they get on their quad bike, they will just go and do it. So um, in terms of that, that point about um, social licence, um, this, is, this is their land. Um, if they think, think something's a good thing to do, they will do it. Um, there doesn't need to be a whole lot of um, consultation with all and sundry. Um, some, some sort of, I don't want to say negatives, but some challenges around the people differences. So these are often farmers, um, but, but private landowners of one form or another. They are not connected to you in any way, in a, as a general rule, right? They're not co connected to the science system. Um, they're not connected to government particularly. So I mentioned Tradis Gantia before, which is one, one weed where there has been good biocontrol research um, and action done. Um, how many of my 4,500 covenanters have got access to Tradis Gantia biocontrol? Does anyone know the answer? I don't know. <laughs> not many of them. Um, so a few of our regional reps get excited about that sort of thing. One, one of our guys was growing the trad beetle in his front front room until his missus got really upset about that. Um, so he was you know, distributing it around a few of his covenant tours, um, but that, that was it, right? That's kind of an informal system. There's, there's no connectivity between what you guys are doing and these people. Um, so how do you create that connectivity? Um, what's more, um, to the bottom point, how do, you, how do you not only connect them, but um, communicate with them in a way that lets them know that that buyer control is a good idea um, is cost effective, um, is not going to cause them any other problems around the farm or anywhere else. So how do you form a conversation with those people? Um, so I guess my, my challenge to you is um, think about the people in, in this whole exercise and whether that be you know, my history in the agriculture sector but my, or my current role um, in the conservation sector is um, you know, the, the challenges of uh, research and you know, what, we, what we call extension are, are people challenges by and large. So you guys can sit in your labs and do, do science all day, but unless there are people out there in the world who are going to pick that stuff up, have confidence in it and run with it, um, it's, it's largely a waste of time. Um, so how do you connect with, with my people? Um, and how do you connect with, you know, if you're working in the agriculture sector, how do you connect with those people? So I did put a slide at the end that says questions, but I don't think I'm allowed. No questions. No questions. We're doing questions in a panel. Uh, later. That's me.